Shots tell the director how to shoot a scene, while transitions tell the editor how to change from one scene or shot to the next. And just like with shots, writing transitions into your screenplay is likely to overstep your responsibilities and clutter your script with jargon that hinders the reading experience. But there are always exceptions to the rule, so let's talk about the options you do have for transitions and how to format them. Your entire script can be written without a single transition. In fact, the majority of scripts I read have zero or just a few. That's because when no transition is included before a new scene heading or shot, a basic cut is assumed. They both laugh. Exterior, restaurant, patio, day. A cut is just an instantaneous change from one scene to the next. In the early days of analog film editing, the actual strip of film would be literally cut at the end of one scene and spliced with the beginning of the next. If you want to explicitly include a cut between the scenes in your script, you'll need to write the transition, cut, or cut to, double line space before the new scene. Cut to, interior, Kinbot's office, Jericho, day. Transitions traditionally either begin six inches from the left edge of your page, or are right aligned to your page margin, or set about a half inch back. As you may have noticed, transitions usually end in a colon, though there are some exceptions we'll cover later in this video. While transitions can be the last line on a page, they should never be the first. You might remember that leaving a scene or character heading alone at the bottom of a page is known as widowing. When an element begins a page that should actually be attached to something on the previous page, it's referred to as an orphan. The transition is an orphan here because it should remain attached to the scene it's transitioning away from. And just like with widows, you can easily fix them by adjusting where you page break. But if a cut is already implied, why use one? Truthfully, you probably shouldn't. But some writers include them to adjust the pacing and rhythm of a scene, increase the white space, or really emphasize the end of a scene. But there are usually better ways to do this with narrative description, and if that's not enough, then you might be better off with a more specific transition than cut two. You could use a hard cut or a smash cut for discordant or jarring changes between scenes. Smash cut two, interior, lounge, day. Or you could use a match cut, which is a stylistic cut where the image, action, sound, or anything else matches from the first scene to the next. Elizabeth shuts her eyes tight, match cut. Interior, governor's mansion, Elizabeth's bedroom, day and then they snap open again, startled wide with fear. Or a cut to black or any other color can be used stylistically for moments like a character being knocked unconscious. Bam, he hits the stone at the foot of the stairs and cut to black. But a quick note here, since transitions like cut to black already include both the transition and what's being transitioned to, they don't require a colon and you often see them with a period instead. There's also a rarely used cut called a time cut that's supposed to emphasize the time passing between shots but it's a pretty odd transition. Time cut two, a map of Pakistan is behind Kumail. It's most often used without a scene heading because it usually advances time without changing the general camera placement, location, or time of day elements in the scene. In that way, it's a bit like when we use later as a secondary heading, but later without a transition implies a standard cut. So a time cut is really just shorthand for something like dissolve to later, which means a time cut isn't usually a cut at all. A dissolve is a more stylized transition that can help indicate things like the passage of time we just saw, or something like a character daydreaming. Dissolve 2. Interior. Ralph's Kitchen. Day. But there are even more extreme transitions, like Iris. Iris 2. Exterior. Courtyard. Day. Morph. Morph 2. Exterior. Normandy American Cemetery and Memorial. Day. And Wipe. Wipe 2. Exterior. Space. But in practice, you're almost always better off leaving these out of your script. In fact, any time a transition is already obvious from context, doesn't enhance the character's plot or theme, or isn't necessary to make sense of things, you shouldn't explicitly include it. Instead, just leave these decisions to the director and the editor. It's their jobs, not ours. But there is one kind of transition you will commonly find in scripts. Fades. Fade in. Exterior. New York Public Library. Day. These are prevalent mainly because many writers open their script with a fade in, but this transition doesn't really play by the normal rules. An opening fade in, and only an opening one, starts the first page, even though we've already said that transition shouldn't be the first thing on a page. And it's left aligned, even though we already said transitions are right aligned. But if you really start to think about what this quote unquote transition is, it starts to make a bit more sense. While other transitions link two scenes together, the opening fade in actually begins the screenplay from nothing. If you imagine the film strip of a movie that cuts or dissolves between two scenes, the actual strip itself is uninterrupted. There's no gap, but an opening fade in is the beginning of the strip. There's nothing from which to transition, so it needs to behave differently than the others. 
All other fades follow standard transition rules, but they still have their own quirks. A fade-in is a gradual transition from a solid color, which means it should only come after it's clear in the script that the screen is a particular color. Most often, this comes in the form of a cut to black or fade to black before we fade back in. Fade to black. Fade in. Interior. Pawn shop. Back room. Day. But you can technically fade to or from any color. Fade to white. Interior. Protos delirium. Day. Though a fade to white is sometimes called a wash instead. If no color is specified, fades are assumed to be to and from black, which is why you'll sometimes see a simple fade out used instead of fade to black. Fade out. Cut to. Interior. Plainview Cottage. Morning. But this is most commonly reserved for the end of the screenplay, as a sort of bookend to the opening fade in, though it isn't something you have to do. Fade out. There's another transition I haven't mentioned that, like the opening fade in, isn't quite a standard transition. The cutaway. Cutaways are a quick cut to another scene and back that are meant to emphasize a point in the larger scene by adding a bit of context or humor, and they can be handled with standard primary headings and implied cuts. Interior. Patient room. Night. Elliot is holding the unconscious weather guy's head up. Interior. Hallway outside exam room. Night. But when we return to the larger scene, the heading is a bit unclear. We want the reader to know that no time has passed since we cut away from the first scene, but repeating the time of day leaves that ambiguous. And using something like continuous wouldn't be correct because that should only refer to the immediately preceding scene. That's why you'll often see a secondary heading note or transition added to indicate we're returning to the original scene. Writing back to scene here is common, but something like back to present would be fine too. If the cutaway is meant to be jarring for effect, you might also want to add a flash or cut transition before the cutaway. But if we do all that, we're looking at two transitions and two scene headings for only a short beat or two. Cutaways are meant to be a quick cut and then back again, but all this formatting means the reading experience is the opposite. For a more efficient approach, we can look at a show known for its cutaways, Family Guy. Take a look at one of their scripts and you'll often see them establish a cutaway with a primary scene heading note. Interior, somebody's house, night, cutaway. It's sometimes as straightforward as cutaway, but can also be something like vision, flash forward, or flash back, depending on the scene. The heading that returns us to the previous scene then includes a note like back to scene. Interior, Griffin's kitchen, day, back to scene. This approach is pretty similar to the previous one, but keeps everything within the scene headings to keep the cutaway more condensed on the page. But if we want, we can further simplify by reducing the return heading to just the back to scene note. Flashback, interior, bullpen, two months ago. Jake and Rosa in rolling chairs hold fire extinguishers. Everyone cheers. McGintley approaches. Okay. They spray the extinguishers and roll across the floor. Back to scene. This technique helps the cutaway feel more like a part of the larger scene. And because of the quick nature of the cutaway, it's usually easy enough for the reader to pick back up where the previous scene left off. In my opinion, that better aligns the reading experience with what a cutaway should actually be. But whichever approach you take, just make sure it's clear on the page. When there isn't a well-established format, no one can really complain as long as you're clear. Often that means writing flawless, efficient narrative description to provide context, which is why you should check out this video to master the basics of description rules and formatting.